Hello. Get your official products such as this marvelous t-shirt that I'm wearing or this great coffee mug that I'm drinking out of and many of the products with the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis logo at https colon slash slash www.zazzle.com slash store slash a stuff store and make sure you get your 15% discount today. Welcome to a new podcast show about stuff. It's the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. Here's you host, Stephen Davis. Yes, it's that time again. Time for the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis show. I have a very special guest today, Dr. Virginia Banks, known to her friends as Dr. D. She is a board certified medical doctor in internal medicine and infectious diseases, which means that she has been at the forefront in the treatment of HIV AIDS and the current COVID-19 pandemic. Hello, Dr. D, how you been? <laughs> Stephen, I'm fine, how are you? As I always say, it just seems like every week, I'm standing up on my own. So that's great. <laughs> that's a bonus. I say that every day. That's a bonus. <laughs> yes. uh, so tell me, Dr. D, where, where were you born at? So I am a, I'm a Tar Heel. I was born in Raleigh, North Carolina and grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina and ultimately moved to Winston-Salem. Talk about your parents. My parents were, my mother was uh, a visionary. My mother was a mathematician, taught math in high school. My dad taught science in high school and junior high school. In fact, he taught me. Um, my dad graduated from Johnson C. Smith University in 1929. And my mom graduated from Talladega um, College in 1940. So they were both products of HBCU. I grew up knowing all about HBCUs all my life. And my parents were all about education. I grew up in the South in during the civil rights era. The civil rights movement was just coming into its own. I remember that. And one of the things that I say about my mom uh, was that they were just starting to integrate schools in the South when I came along. And my mother felt that even though my education in the African-American high schools that we had, everything was segregated at that time, was good. I had excellent teachers in elementary school and junior high, but she petitioned the school board to say that I needed to take German, which at that time was a, was an, a language that if you were going into medicine or any of the sciences, it was a prerequisite. So. J.W. Ligon High School in Raleigh didn't have German, so she petitioned the school board for me to go to Needham B. Broughton High School in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I talk about that experience in an, in an essay that I wrote in Tavis Smiley's book. It was about keeping the faith, and my essay was about education was the ticket out. That experience at Broughton, I think, framed who I am today in terms of having to undergo and withstand and endure and tolerate a lot of things. It, it just so happened, and I say this all the time, that I went to Fayetteville, I was in Fayetteville, and I went to 71st High, and there was like 10, 15, 20 of us that integrated that high school at that particular period of time. So I know the conditions that you were living under. How did you feel when you left the high school that you were at or the, the set of schools that you were at that were segregated and they were black and you moved over to the white school. What was it like going there the first day? It was hell. This is what I said in the essay. It wasn't like Ruby Bridges or there weren't people standing outside screaming and yelling at me like I remember seeing in the, the kids, the Little Rock Nine and people screaming and yelling outside. By that time, the the anger towards me was more insidious, although sometimes it was overt. Um, but the children, the, the kids in the high school just didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I think 
what happened was the principal, and this happened to me not only at Broughton where I spent two years, but also my last year in high school was at RJ Reynolds in Winston-Salem. The principal went to the teachers and pretty much said, we're not gonna tolerate any issues here. And although the teachers couldn't prevent everything that happened from me, the principal was not about to have any of those scenes like you saw when the kids were integrating the schools in Arkansas. I think what, what happened to me was that I took a lot of the courses for science and math courses, and they didn't know me from Adam when I came to class. And there were just things that were demeaning. People didn't want to sit next to you. They would go out of their way to try to sit in, in another seat. I would go into the auditorium for pep rallies. You remember the days of pep rallies. Oh, and we'd go, into the, we'd go into the gym, and I always had butterflies in my stomach, knots in my stomachs, because I knew that whoever was behind me in line was going to leave that whole row empty and move into another a row of seats so that they wouldn't have to sit next to me and everybody would start laughing about that. Or in science class, when I the seats were next to each other and the teacher would come and hand us some something or other to look at in biology. And we were supposed to hand it back to the person behind us. And the person behind me, of course, I never will, you never forget any of these episodes. They wouldn't take it with their hands. They would let it fall on the table. Then they would go get up and get a paper towel and pick it up. And then everybody in the room would laugh. So that, those instances lasted overtly like that, never really stopped until the first grading period came out and I got A's and everything. And I just knocked the top out of everything. I, of course, I had to study, obviously, but in everything. And it was at that point that things turned around for me a little bit. And like I said, that's those experiences framed me. It was I remember some of the kids that were the, the meanest to me and the most racist. I remember one morning looking up because my dad, who taught at the Black High School, had to drop me off at school at 7.30. So I had to sit in the auditorium and study. And I remember one morning, this was maybe after the second grading period was the same. And some kids came and were standing over me and I was like, oh my God, what are they gonna do to me? And they said, we wanted to know if you would help us with our homework. And I was shocked. I was, I didn't know what to say. This was German, which I've always loved languages. It was German and I can't, it was another course that I'd gotten an A in. And I, my mother taught us to, I didn't hate anybody and I helped them with their homework and their grades improved. So I can't say that the, the kids stopped treating me as badly as they did, but it was a lot less so when they found out that I was a smart kid. And that's what I think helped me. Did you, the teachers begin to look at you and to see how you were because their, what they thought in terms of Blacks and their mental abilities, you shocked them. You must have shocked them. How, how did they react to after that first grading period? I think absolutely they were, many of them were shocked. They, I don't think they showed it, but I do remember my German teacher and my biology teacher told the whole class, there was only one person that got an A in here. And the look and the shock on the face of the kids around me. So I can honestly say, except maybe, and she's not around anymore, so I can say this, except for geometry, where it was apparent that she was just not gonna, and my grades weren't, my geometry, she was, I think, more shocked than anybody, but I think that the teachers, for the most part, kept their bigotry, if that's what you might call it, or if even if they had it, from me, because I can't say that I was treated badly by the teachers. I, I just, I can't remember, can't remember that. And they had to be fair, because as my mother taught, my mother was all about I remember this was another situation where when I first got there, it was like I said, it was hell being called the N word every day, those, those, the, the, the being embarrassed and humiliated like I was. And I would come home and tell my mom, I don't know if I can do this. And my mom, just in her own way, she never said a word about, I'm not sure that I want to keep you there. My mother just brushed past all of it. She didn't say anything about racism or bigotry or anything. Her comment was, well, did you get an A? I mean, well, did you get an A? So that was her response 
the whole time. And so I just figured like, yeah, I'll just get an A and it worked. <laughs> but now, first of all, tell the audience your father's name and your mother's name. <clears throat> so my father's name is George Fisher Newell. He was from Clarkton, North Carolina, not too far from where you went to high school. He was from Bladen County. Yes. And he uh, matriculated from there on, and he, his family didn't have a lot of means, as much, but he had one parent was a, a college graduate. I'm, on my mom's side, she was from advanced North Carolina, Davie County, right outside of Forsyth County, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And her parents were just good, hardworking people. She had eight brothers and sisters. But the theme that ran through both my parents with their parents was education. When you hear a lot, even today, you hear a lot of kids saying nobody ever talked to them about college. When they get to in the senior high school, they don't have role models to talk to them about college. And I think my, my parents were very lucky. My dad was born in 1905, so you do the math. And my mom, who just turned 104, was born in 1917 <laughs> and still alive. <laughs> And still doing everything. She slowed down, of course, but still mentally completely with it. They were fortunate enough to, to have parents to push them from an education standpoint. And my parents knew that from an early on, they grew up on farms that might not be what they wanted to do for the rest of their lives, but they knew that they had to study and graduate from school to get out of there. My mom's study. name is Virginia K. Newell, Virginia okay. Kimbrough you. Newell. I forgot Thank to say that, you. Dr. Virginia Kimbrough Newell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I must say that one of the highlights of my being on this earth was meeting your mother. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was such a grand day. Bo yes, both days, yes. actually. You came to both events. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Now, I want the audience to know a little bit more about your mom because she has some historic pieces in her background. Yeah, she finished Talladega College and my mother did something in 1958 that was revolutionary for women in those days. She came to my dad and I was whatever age I was and my sister was whatever <laughs> age she was and uh, <laughs> not going to trap me on this. <laughs> but anyway, she came to my dad and she said, I got a scholarship to study at the University of Chicago, the new math. And my dad, their age spread was about 13 years. And you can imagine what my dad thought, leave home and leave me with these two girls and stuff. And my mother said, yep, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, so they had their squabbles and so forth. And I remember lots of arguments, but my mom said, I'm going. And she had found a nanny for us who was actually living next door. It was the best thing that ever happened to for her. She was the only African-American woman to matriculate. The University of Chicago is still a great school. And she finished the year doing the new math. She was only able to come home in December and June. So she, and from that, she went on to use that education. Every year she was asked to do more teaching in more, she was teaching at Shaw University, which is a historically black college. And from then from Shaw, she went to Winston-Salem State. But while she was at Shaw, after having that degree, advanced degree from University of Chicago, she did great things like two summers, some teachers, black and white, were brought to Yale Divinity School for Yale Summer High School. And it was at that time that African-Americans from many of the historically black colleges and white teachers from Yale and Harvard and Princeton and Dartmouth came together and they taught, you'll be interested in this. I don't even know if you know that story. They were kids from the Bedford-Stuyvesant area. Am I saying that correct? We called it Bed-Stuy. And they brought these kids there. And in exchange for them studying that summer, they took science and math and theater and literature. They were all, if they wanted, given a full scholarship to one of the um, prep schools. Phillips Exeter and Choate and Deerfield and all of those. And so my mom taught there for those two summers. And then she was a campaign manager for Shirley Chisholm when she ran for president um, back in the 70s. She was a city councilman. They were called aldermen for over 20 years in Winston-Salem. And when you go to Winston-Salem, you see all of her footprints, um, a, a little statue here or a park that she opened or taking the community that we lived in, which again, 
We still don't even have that here in Youngstown. She realized that there was a food desert in that area. And she brought in a grocery store in that black neighborhood because there's one so many black neighborhoods today you don't have a grocery store people have to get on the bus and do all this traveling so she did that back in the late um 80s so when she turned 100 i never would have imagined the city turned out she was given the key to the city she was given whatever you call it in north carolina it was the it's called the, the pine leaf or something award meaning that she got the highest honor that a civilian can get in North Carolina. And two of our congressmen from North Carolina came on the floor and a proclamation was done in her honor on the floor of Congress for her birthday, October the 7th. And it was funny because my sister and I were hiding it from her. My mother's always protected her age. If somebody wanted to know her age, it was like, uh. So for this proclamation, so we called her on the phone, my sister and I, just to make sure, because we had somebody there to make sure that she saw it. And Stephen, the only thing that bothered her, instead of saying, oh, that's great, I'm so happy that Mr. Butterfield and Mrs. Uh, Adams got on the floor, now they know my age. They're going to know I'm 100. I'm like, in order to get a proclamation yeah, like that. Was this this was not, this was during Trump's time, not Obama? No, it was during Obama. Obama Did gave her. her he certainly did. He certainly did. And, he, and they who were came to that event? That besides, uh, um, you know, some of the people that came to the event for that event, you know, Maya, of course, was deceased by that time, or she would have. Dr. Maya Angelou would have okay. come to that event, but she was. My mother has outlived everybody. She was deceased at that time, but the people that came to that event were the congressmen and, and senators from North Carolina. They didn't come, they sent state people. And I just, and then she got proclamations from everybody. I think the person that she really missed the most having there was Dr. Maya Angelou, whom they were best friends. And Dr. Angelou had died some years before then, but it was a grand event. We videotaped it and uh, it was just great seeing how people got up and told stories about how she helped them and her students came back and what they were doing. And what a hundred and your students now are in their age. Some of them are in their eighties. One of her students was, you will know him, Reverend James Forbes, who was the pat minister at Riverside, I believe was where he was. And um, his sister was is married to Congressman Ed Towns. There were a lot of Forbeses. They were from Raleigh, North Carolina. There were a lot yeah, of Forbes kids. I, I know kids. James Forbes and, and, his, and Gwen, his sister, very well, particularly our Congressman Ed Towns. Yes. So he remembered, my mom taught him and taught several of his siblings. Ronald, who was my age, was my first rival in first grade in North Carolina. I don't know, I think Ronald, I heard he went on to become a physician like me, but yeah, there were many of them. And they came from that type of family where the father, I believe, they were raised in the holiness church, as we called it in those days. And their parents were all about education. And I believe that every single one of those kids graduated from college and or went on for a terminal degree. That's where we came from. My parents knew the Delaney sisters. You remember the Delaney sisters, the, the Broadway play. play. <laughs> and they were from Raleigh. Their dad was from St. Augustine's College and all of that. Those were the times in the South where we were exposed to great people. And we, many of us still say we stood on those shoulders growing up and learned about black history. We didn't have to relearn it because we experienced black history. My dad was a chauffeur for uh, Mrs. Johnson C. Smith at Johnson C. Smith University. And he would tell us driving around James Weldon Johnson and a lot of the black historians, Carter G. Woodson and all these greats that we heard about growing up because my dad was the chauffeur bringing them to the they, it, was a, it was a lecture series that they had at Johnson C. Smith for the students and would bring in some noteworthy person. So yeah, those were, it wasn't all bad. It wasn't all bad. I, I had a childhood acquaintance. She was two years older than me and she went to Johnson C. Smith and, and I think she became one of, the, if not the first, one of the first black council members for the city of Charlotte. I think her name is Carlina 
Ivory. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. But she, I mean, she lived in Fayetteville. Yeah, a lot of a lot of good people came through the HBC, my medical school back in the 70s. A lot of the African American kids that came there that did well came from schools like Tougaloo. The second female, and we're still friends today. I hear from her on Facebook. We're on Facebook now together. But her name is Dr. Deborah Hyde. She was the second a black female neurosurgeon in the country. And she came from Tougaloo. These schools put out great people. And one of the things that my mom says, this is one of the things that I think is a little unknown fact. When my mother was in college in the late thirties, early forties, this was during the time when the Nazis were wreaking havoc all over Europe. They hadn't invaded Poland. I think that was 1939, but a lot of the intellectual Jewish people were getting out of the country. They could not find jobs in the United States. So where did the Albert Einsteins and the people like that go for, for and protégés of him to the historically black colleges? Because that's where they could get a job. And so my mother had the benefit of not being taught by Albert Einstein, but by being taught by a protege of Albert Einstein. How great was that? Somebody that had touched Albert Einstein. So these kids back in those days at the HBCUs got great educations because of the Jewish professors that left Nazi Germany and couldn't find a job at Yale or Harvard or Princeton or some of these schools. True fact. It was, there's a documentary out on that talks about that's a little known fact. Okay, Let, let's get to you some more now. <laughs> oh, uh, not me. <laughs> okay, you graduate from high school. Where was your, what was your next move? So my next move was, there was no grand victory lap from graduating from high school. It was, where are you going to go next? So I chose um, Western College for Women. And there were four schools that I applied to, and I didn't get into University of Chicago. I didn't get into Mount Holyoke, and I didn't get into Oberlin, and I got into Western College for Women. And why did I pick that school? I always wanted to go to one of the Seven Sisters. And, my, and so I didn't get into Mount Holyoke, but I applied. But Western College was founded by one of the founders of Mount Holyoke. So it was the Seven Sister of the Midwest. And so they brought with them out to the Midwest, the same sort of educational, if you will, thing that the Seven Sisters had. So my mom was one of these kind of mothers. And I didn't even know anything about the college, Stephen. It was like, okay, I'm going to pick this school to go. And my mother was one of these kinds. She says, well, if you're going there, you're going to stay there because people in the country can count to four. One, two, three, four, you'll be graduating. So that was my next move. And my parents really didn't push me into medicine. I always wanted to be a doctor. My role model was I had an uncle, Uncle Leo, Dr. Leo Samuel Kimbrough. He served in World War II in Italy and came back to this country and was extremely smart and finished college. And then he wanted to go to medical school where he couldn't get in. And he ended up going to medical school in Belgium and ended up studying there. And when he would come back, it was like I said in the essay that I wrote for Tavis Smiley, it was like in the Nutcracker Suite when Herr Drosselmeyer comes and all the kids sit around him. That was what it was like sitting around Uncle Leo. And that spurned my interest for becoming a physician. And then I went to Case Western Medical School. There were 10, everything was kind of cauterized in those days. So it was 110 in my class, 10 women, four black women and six black African-American men, black men. And, and so that was it. There were very few females in my class, very few African-Americans. I had a great time in medical school. Was there You're from North Carolina. You have familiar, familiarity with being in North Carolina because that's where you grew up at, but you had a, a great infrastructure of family to, to help you in terms of it. And then all of a sudden, you're in the Midwest. Were you by yourself? By myself. So you, you get off the plane or the train. You go to your class. How did you feel that first day when you walked onto the campus and know that you were going to be here for four years? I was like, for me, I was like a fish out of water. So many of those girls had come from 
the East. They were very, they were from families. They were, we called ourselves the seven sister rejects because most of the, the, the girls had gotten rejected from one of the seven sisters. So I went to school with some of the great families in New York that were financiers and so forth. And I was a country bumpkin. What did I feel like my first day on, uh, at school was that I wasn't sophisticated at all. I felt that I was book smart. Now you're thrown into a dormitory. Girls were smoking. I didn't have a great social life. I had a room, roommate who was related to P.T. Barnum, a Caucasian young lady. It was a cultural experience for me. Again, V.K. Newell was on my shoulders and was constantly whispering in my ear, so to speak, that I was there to get an education. I was still going to be in, in education. Going to college and it's just your first experience of being away from home. My parents were pretty, pretty strict. And now you have to make choices and you have to make sure that they're good choices. So it was scary because I, I just was not as sophisticated as, as a lot of those girls. And there were very few girls from North Carolina. Like I said, all those girls were from New York and Philadelphia and places like that. Someone told me a, a, a little while ago, and I had to think about it, and it's so true, is that sometimes we think that we're not as sophisticated as we would like to be. But when you talk about how to set a table, who set the tables? Who, who knew that? So we when did. you went to African-American homes, you had that in the homes because they were doing that at work. <laughs> Absolutely. So they were a little bit more further than even they thought. Now you go to college, you finish college. You, did you have any memorable experiences while you were at college that, that haunts you to this day? I don't know that any of them haunt me. Of course, we probably all drank too much and partied too much. I remember sneaking up, of course, I snuck out of the dorm. I remember driving over with some girlfriends to Dayton, Ohio, to a place called the Tahiti Hut. And I had a Singapore sling. That oh, was my dream. It was that kind of thing. So yeah, there were things that we did and we crawl back in because on those days it was the dorms were closed at midnight on the weekends and 11 o'clock during the weekdays. So yeah, I climbed through a window or two to get back into school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My mom will finally know this. I tried not to do too many wild things because I knew that I knew that I had to keep my eye on the prize. And when you were a science major and you had an organic chemistry test or a chemistry test or whatever, my thing always was I would party on Friday nights, allow myself to do that. And maybe just a little bit on Saturday, not a lot, maybe go to a dance or something. And then Sunday was all day studying. I spent all day studying. And if I had a date or something, which I didn't do a lot of dating those maybe the first year, it was always going to the library first and then we'll go to an alpha party or some fraternity or we didn't have any sororities down there at the time, but yeah, but I, I did that. So yeah. You know. it, it would seem to me that you did that in particular because even though you did a little party, you knew that you had to face your mother oh. you did not do right. You know, <laughs> I, I, you saw how my face just dropped. That was a fate worse than. She would send you these letters, Stephen. She'd send you these famous letters, which she still does today. Um, and it would be like, just get you completely straight. She just was not, oh my God, for me to disappoint her. And that was also, those were during the days when kids were starting to take over the campus build. I think it started in Columbia, at Columbia, and it trickled down to us and kids were getting arrested and stuff like that. And I don't think they realized that getting arrested in 1968 would follow you unless they expunged your record and it would keep you from maybe getting a law license or a medical license because that stuff would follow you like chewing gum on the bottom of your shoe. And I knew that I couldn't get arrested because I'd have to face VK and that was worse than being in jail. Oh no. I also <laughs> want to tell you that you mentioned 68 and I'm sure people... <laughs> I was a child prodigy. <laughs> I was a child prodigy. <laughs> Doogie Hauser. <laughs> oh, okay. Now you get out of out of undergrad and you go to Case Western. How did you pick Case Western 
as opposed to some other medical school? I was dating someone at the time who became my husband and he was going to law school in Akron. And I knew I wanted to be at one of the medical schools in Ohio, but I also applied to Howard and Harry and, and so forth. And, and then one of my classmates from Western, Joanne Dyson, ended up going to Case Western. And I liked the curriculum. It was a very avant-garde curriculum. And what they did was instead of the traditional, they did do that didactic thing with teaching, but they also had part of the program was self-teaching where you would meet in groups and do the self-teaching kind of thing. Now, I didn't sway towards that group because I was more of a didactic person. I just couldn't learn with somebody telling me something up here that I didn't think that he knew what he was talking about anyway. But they also assigned you a pregnant woman and you follow this woman through the delivery. And if you were lucky, you might even get a chance to deliver the baby, even as a first or second year medical student. And then you followed that woman and the baby through their pediatric appointments. The purpose of this was twofold. Case Western also had a huge social responsibility makeup, if you will. It was all about giving back to the community. And so these women could come and get free care, obstetrical care, and free pediatric visits. What's bad about that with great physicians, many physicians. This is where Dr. Spock worked many years. And, but also it was an opportunity as I was up mentoring some students at Case about a month ago and I said, the other thing was that when you're in medical school and you're learning all this biochemistry, you can't keep your eye on the prize of becoming a physician because you just can't think that this Krebs cycle is going to have anything to do with you becoming a physician. And so it was an opportunity to throw you into being a doctor your first two years of medical school for you to say, ah, this is what it's all about. So it was a great program. I, I want our uh, li listeners to understand Dr. Spock was a doctor, not Mr. Spock. You have to say that because I said the other day to somebody, I said well, it was a young millennial and I said the Muppet Man and she was like, who's the Muppet Man? <laughs> That's where that 1968 come back. <laughs> yeah, mm. Dr. Spock, not Mr. Spock. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Now, where did you do your uh, residency mm -hmm. at? So my internship was done first at the Cleveland Clinic. I was going into radiology, okay. although it's called today residency. All of them are called residency. But in those days, the first year was an internship. And I did that at the Cleveland Clinic in radiology because I thought I wanted to do radiology. And then I was a super hyper type A person. My other classmates went to University Hospitals of Cleveland and they were in internal medicine on call in the trenches every third night, not getting any sleep. And I was here at the Cleveland Clinic doing radiology on call, maybe every fourth or fifth night, not doing very much. My first few months there, one of my friends sent me a pillow and I called him on the phone. I said, Don, why did you send me a pillow? He goes, well, that's all you're going to ever need as a radiologist. You'll just be sitting on a pillow. That's all I needed. <laughs> I went to the chief. <laughs> that's all I needed. This true story. I ran across the, 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 the street, city, whatever, to Dr. Charles C.J. Carpenter's office. And I said, Dr. Carpenter, I have seen the errors of my ways. I do not want to be a radiologist. I want to come back here and do internal medicine. And he said, just finish the year out at the Cleveland Clinic in internal medicine, and you can come back here where you will be on call every third. And it was tough, but that's what I, I wanted because I just didn't, I was, I've always been one of these kind of people that I couldn't imagine my friends being on call every third night and I'm in radiology. That just was not who I am. I did a year of internship there at the clinic and then two years of internal medicine residency at Case at University Hospitals of Cleveland. I knew I didn't want to stop then. And what interested me more was the field of infectious diseases. And I find myself, of course, because of COVID now talking about why did I go into infectious diseases? Because in those days, it was still a relatively new subspecialty. It wasn't like a cardiologist, wasn't like pulmonary. And in fact, somebody came up to me and said, why are you going into infectious diseases? Because everybody knows how to use penicillin and ampicillin and you're not going to have a job. Here we are. And the other thing was that I felt that my mentors 
who are infectious disease specialists were the smartest people there. You have to know a little bit about every single subspecialty to do ID, because when somebody calls you and they say, so-and-so has a fever, you have to put your Sherlock Holmes hat on and go in and know a little bit of cardiology and a little bit of neurology and a little bit of this. So that's why I, I chose that field. And when you graduated, what was your first job after that? So my first job was not doing infectious diseases. I don't know whether it was a social responsibility job or just something that I wanted to do. I went to work for an organization called the Glenville Health Association. And it was an organization run by two African-American physicians in the inner city, whatever that means. I don't like to use that term, but in the inner city of Cleveland, administering care for a lot of predominantly African-Americans. And it was just something that I felt that I wanted to do. The income was great. And it was an opportunity for me to, again, do my social responsibility thing and give back to the neighborhood. And it was a good experience, not the best experience that I've ever had, but it was two years there. And I don't regret at all having done that. But it was then that I knew I had to, to leave there after two years because I was forgetting too much infectious diseases and then came back and got a job working in a hospital actually doing infectious diseases. That was, hospital. it was a St. Luke's Hospital in Cleveland, which, you know, no, it was Huron, I'm sorry, Huron Road Hospital in Cleveland, which Unfortunately, the way of hospitals, it's now a parking lot, as many of the other hospitals are that I left in Cleveland, or at least some, maybe Mount Sinai is a parking lot in Cleveland. Huron Road is some facsimile of whatever. But uh, I stayed there for a number of years and then moved to, by this time I was married to somebody else. You're going to hear, hear all these stories here now. I was married to somebody else. <laughs> I won't ask you about that. <laughs> another lawyer, another lawyer. And uh, we moved to Minnesota because of his job and again, worked in infectious diseases there. So I've had a long career of doing infectious diseases and will always remember what that person said to me about, you're not going to have a job. There was no AIDS then, there was no HIV AIDS, there was no Ebola, there was no multi-drug resistant organisms. Everything pretty much was susceptible to penicillin and ampicillin. We've come a long way in infectious diseases. I think of the 20th century, the evolution of infectious diseases for me would be one of the top 10 things of what's happened in the 20th century. How did your parents react to your graduating and becoming a doctor? They were ecstatic. They tried to hide it, but my dad, <laughs> who he wanted to go to medical school, but his parents couldn't afford it. He was smart enough. My dad was valedictorian of everything. My dad wanted two boys. He had already painted the rooms blue. And here these girls come along. And I just always felt I wanted to be the son that my dad wanted because after two girls, my mom was like, mm, that's it. You'll have to find the boy someplace else because that's not going to happen here. <laughs> <laughs> not here. So I just, I always, that was always a goal for me to complete medical school because I knew my dad wanted to be a doctor and my mom too. Yeah, they were ecstatic. And then I don't, I didn't realize Stephen ha after having four children, I guess I, and my sister, which you certainly mentioned is a physician as well. And people would always say, and this is from the South, people would always say, well, Dr. Newell, how did you and George Newell have two daughters to go to medical school. And we just took it for granted. This is what we were gonna do. And we didn't have a lot of indebtedness. My parents, as I say, took two fish and a bottle of wine and fed the multitude. Although we didn't go out to dinner a lot. My dad was running around turning off lights. Air conditioner wasn't that high because he said, I'm not trying to freeze the outside. There were all, and when my little friends would call from out of town on the telephone, my dad would say, it's about time. To and one other thing, if I might add, in terms of what my parents did for me, if I, if I might add, my mother, it wasn't my parents, because my dad was opposed to it. My mother sent me to Germany. And this was 20 plus years post-war. And I lived with a German family. And I spoke, because I took it in high school, I spoke, my German was pretty good, although there's nothing like living with the family, so I became a lot more fluent. But it was interesting. My mother said that she sent me to Germany on the experiment in international living because she wanted me to see that not everybody was like 
the Caucasian people that I was going to high school with. And not everybody was mean to everybody. Of course, now she's sending me to Germany and there was that whole Holocaust thing. So there's all kinds of issues with that, but I was treated nicely by my family. And so that was one of the things that she did as a, a visionary kind of thing for me. Now, did your sister, who you mentioned, tell the audience? Her name is Dr. Glenda Newell Harris, and she's a physician in out of Oakland, California. Okay. Now, did she become a physician because her big sister became a physician? She would tell you. So I guess I have to believe what do you say? Right? she's sticking to that story. So it's her story. And if she's sticking to it, Cool. <laughs> My sister did a little bit more partying than I did. She uh -huh. had a little bit better time in college than I did, but she studied and she went to Tufts in Boston. So she had that Boston experience, but she also, just to brag on my sister a little bit, she left, she, my, my mother sent her to Miss Porter's School for Girls where Jackie Kennedy went and it's in, it's in Connecticut, Farmington, Connecticut. And she was the first African-American um, student to matriculate at Miss Porter's. And just this year, they named a building after her, the Glenda Newell Harris uh, building that's named after her on the campus of Miss Porter. So she said she, no, she said she wanted to go into medicine and she didn't do what, she didn't go into infectious diseases. She ended up doing internal medicine and she's now regional director for a, a prison system, Corizon. So we, we follow different pathways, but I don't know, sometimes I think, yeah, she did. <laughs> looked up the big sister. And that's your story. You stick that's to my it. story, and I'm sticking to that. <laughs> yeah, oh. Pretty much. In the early 80s, this great disease that overtook humanity, known as HIV, AIDS, began to occur. Tell us about your involvement from the beginning until in, in terms of fighting this disease. <clears throat> So I think I remember my first patient was about 1985 and we didn't know what, what it was because HIV, AIDS, the disease, whatever it was called in 1981 was just emerging and it didn't really trickle down to us in Cleveland, I don't believe until about 1984, 85. So I didn't know what to think. We really didn't think in the early, very early 80s that it was going to become as much of an epidemic pandemic as it did, but it was another one of those kind of things where we didn't listen to the science. We didn't, we thought, we saw this as a gay man's disease. And soon after it was growing fast in this country and we were figuring out how it spread, simultaneously in Africa, it was not in the LGBTQ community. It was in, it was in women. And so the United States just ignored that and just didn't see that this disease was spreading to women like it was in Africa. So we missed the boat and a lot of people got infected that might not have gotten infected at that point. By the end of 1980, it was overwhelming. And for me, in the early 1990s, for me, it was just overwhelming. By this time, the hospital was getting filled with patients. We didn't have much in our armamentarium in terms of drugs. From diagnosis to death was anywhere from 14 months to two years. Hardly anybody lived beyond that. And I never wanted to go into hematology, oncology, because I didn't like dealing with death and dying. And here we had people that were my age now dying. Um, of a disease that they didn't know anything about. They didn't, by this time, of course, they knew it was sexually transmitted, but it was within a lifestyle that, you know, people already had and so forth. So it was just overwhelming and nothing made me, nothing makes me happier now, almost 40 years hence, that is one pill, one pill that people take to treat it, but we have one pill that people can take to prevent it. So technically, there theoretically should not be any new cases of HIV AIDS. But because we have healthcare disparities and because some people have access to medicines and stuff that other people don't, not everybody knows about uh, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. I've just seen the evolution of this disease. When my patients come in the office now, I don't see patients in the office anymore. Most of them in the hospital now, but it's social visit. Dr. Banks, hey, I like your scarf or whatever, as opposed to 
they're going to be in the hospital and they'll be dead in 14 months. So I've seen that evolution. And it's another one of those great strides that has been made in the 20th century. A pregnant woman can be HIV positive and have an HIV negative baby. And that's, again, changed the social dynamics of the patients. They now had a raison debt reason to live because you knew you didn't have to have a baby who was positive. So I've just, I've seen the whole evolution. What were you, because it was such an African disease, at least that's what they say, were you involved at all in the Ebola crisis? The only, the, no, I was, I didn't go there because I, there's some things that infectious disease people are afraid of and those that are extremely contagious. And I, I wouldn't have had an opportunity to go either, but we were involved because we did not know who was coming back to this country. So I was working for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center at that time in near, near Ohio. And we had to learn, we had to go to Pittsburgh to learn to don and doff Ebola patients. So we were all trained to take care of Ebola patients had they come to our hospital. So to that extent, that was how I was involved. And I was pretty scared because we put on those, we learned to don, put on and doff, take off in an air conditioned room because it was so hot. I cannot imagine in the Congo how those doctors survived in those protective uh, equipment like they did. It must have been absolutely horrible for them. We fast forward, because uh, I do want to get this particular piece in. We fast forward to uh, uh, two or three years ago when the first signs of COVID-19 began appearing. D were you able to recognize some of the signs very early on at that something was really happening? Mm -hmm. I don't, and I say this, you're a Facebook follower of mine too, and I don't want to pat myself on the back, but what I do pat myself on the back is that I was one of the old infectious disease specialists. And the principles and practice of infectious diseases haven't really changed much since the Renaissance. And those people in those days during the plague and so forth, they knew how to curtail illnesses and polio, and we knew that vaccines and so forth. What's, what bothered me was when the, the, uh, the accounts of this disease were coming out of Wuhan, China, Northern Italy, like around Lake Como and so forth. And they were saying that it was droplet spread, meaning that you had to be further than six feet of somebody and it was spread from somebody to somebody who was near somebody who was near somebody who was near somebody. And no, I didn't think anything about it in January, but by February, when the numbers were starting to go up logarithmically, I felt that this was an airborne illness. It was in the air. There was no way any kind of virus like this could spread logarithmically. And I remember an old professor, Dr. John Bartlett from Hopkins, got up at a meeting about 15 years ago and he was talking about bird flu. And like I told you, not we don't, ID people, we'll run it. Hair on fire, we'll run in any kind of infectious disease rule. Arr! He said that if bird flu ever turned into an airborne illness, that would scare him more than anything because then we would have a major worldwide pandemic. That's what happened with coronavirus. People didn't realize or were not ready to accept or weren't telling anybody that this was an airborne illness. So we didn't do the necessary protective things that we should have done early on to maybe prevent some things. So to that extent that I could, I tried to encourage and engage people to do those things of the principles and practices of infectious diseases to prevent airborne illnesses, like what's airborne? Measles, tuberculosis. And we, we found a way to curtail those kinds of things. And now we have the great vaccines and boosters, and it's become a political issue for reasons that are unclear sometimes, but it's been all about COVID. My life, my life has changed. It's just all about COVID. My practice in the hospital where I see patients, we sometimes we think the numbers are going down and we're getting a handle on this, but right now we're on not just an uptick, the numbers are going up higher. And I was just talking to one of my colleagues just before I came on the show with you today. And I was, we were talking, I said, doctor, he, got, he just got COVID, he was vaccinated. 
as we know, our immunity is waning. But we're trying to figure out, he walked around in a bubble. He had a little baby at home, and we used to always laugh at him because doctor had a this on, he had that on, he had shields and this. And even when we were, things were lessening a little bit, and then he got it. So we said, if anybody could get it, if he got it, anybody could, could get it. So I do think for the audience, this isn't going to be the last. We're changing our ecology. We're in climate changes. Um, we're changing, we're destroying our rainforest. We have a lot of these animals that are coming out of the rainforest with a lot of these viruses that have never seen the light of day because they've lived in a symbiotic relationship with these animals. And this coronavirus is not going to be the last. So I just think we need to strap in and stay tuned. Well, what, do you, what do you say to the deniers? I would say go to a cemetery an old cemetery and look at the number of children that didn't make it to two years old. A lot of families had 14 and 15 kids because maybe only seven of them lived because of diseases that we have wiped out with vaccinations. Everybody during my era, your parents remember somebody that was on an iron lung. And I would just say that Look at the science. You cannot deny the number of people that have died. The number and the numbers are increasing. And I try to bring people that are the naysayers and the anti-vaxxers into the hospital rooms with me. Because it's hard to relate to this if you're not in the hospital. You might see somebody with a cough and go, oh, it's nothing. But you have to go into a hospital situation with me and see the nurses that are overworked, the doctors that are overworked. We're all just at our wits end. And I think that just like with polio and measles and mumps, that we can eradicate this, but I don't know the difference between our parents and the polio epidemic and the measles and the mumps, when the government told us to do something, because there were not so many things that created a mistrust in the government. People didn't know about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. They didn't know about Henrietta Lacks, the story of Henrietta Lacks. Yes. And they didn't know about those kinds of things. There was no CNN or Fox or any of these things to bring out things to give people that element of mistrust. So people took a leap of faith and blind faith and marched us up to the local elementary school in the 60s to take that sugar cube. And nobody was worried about double blind, randomized, triple double blind studies. They just took it on a leap of faith. Today, we have a lot of social media that's feeding into our brains. And it's very difficult to separate fact and fallacy because you don't know who the messengers are. I try to present myself as a trusted messenger for those people that believe me, but there are a lot of people that are coming on claiming to be the messengers and the know-it-alls, and you don't know what kind of qualifications they have or what basis they're making their, as I call them, armchair epidemiology opinions about. So I think that's part of the problem. And all I can do is just preach every day because this thing is bigger than me. And I'm just hoping that it just doesn't consume us by people being political because I have every day somebody wanting to argue me about something and I'm tired of arguing. I'm just hoping that those people that are not getting it will hopefully come on board and that at some point in time we can reach a global, remember it's just not the United States people that have to get vaccinated and boosted up. We have to get it to Madagascar and we have to get it to the Aleutian Islands and those kind of places before we have some kind of herd immunity. And to be honest with you, we never really reached herd immunity with smallpox or with polio. What wiped it out was vaccinations. And so we probably will never reach a herd immunity here. What will work, hopefully, is vaccines. I am sure, me, myself included, We'll all come out of this with some PTSD. We're exhausted. We're, our nerves are, we're afraid. Our nerves are afraid. We're trying to do the best we can with everybody. It is extremely exasperating to see all of these unvaccinated individuals whom we've taken the Hippocratic Oath to take care of, who made a conscious decision not to get vaccinated who are in the intensive care units for weeks and months, taking up the beds and ventilators and this of patients that I have sitting down in the emergency room 
whose grand, or, or friends or relatives or patients who have a heart attack or a stroke or this, who can't get into the intensive care unit because they're all being filled with unvaccinated people who, again, I repeat, made a conscious effort not to get vaccinated because they didn't think anything was going to happen to them. Every day in my hospital, we hear something. I, I, I was at a board meeting for the art museum the other day. It was a question about, should we take our mask off and all of that? And I had to bring them into the intensive care unit where I was that day, where I had to go back to after the meeting to say how sometimes angry we all are at these individuals who made a conscious decision not to get vaccinated, who are taking up somebody else's bed that we could be treating. It's hard. We're only human. And I know we all took the Hippocratic Oath, and I can honestly say we treat everybody the same, but it doesn't mean that we can't be angry. It doesn't mean that. Well, what, what was the Art Institute? You, you're a board member of the Art Institute, so I want to give you, <laughs> uh, let you give a shout out for it. <laughs> so I am, I do wear other hats. That keeps me sane. I'm on the board of trustees for the Butler Institute of American Art here in Youngstown, one of the foremost American art museums in this country. Great museum with our director, Luzona. I'm also on the board of trustees for the Canton Museum of Art, another wonderful museum with our director, Max Barton. I'm also on the Neo-Med, Neo-UCOM, we used to be called that, the Northeast Ohio a University of, of uh, Medicine and Pharmacy. I'm on the foundation board there. So I just, a little of this and a little of that, I'm on the Infectious Disease Society of America. I'm on the leadership, I had I'm a co-chair of the Leadership Development Committee, and I'm co-chair of the LINCS. COVID task force, and I'm co-chair of the George Counts Committee. This is a new group of people, of persons of color, African Americans, and people of the diaspora. And we just formed a group under, for the Infectious Disease Society of America. First time it's happened. So we're all coming together because one of the things that led to this, Stephen, is that we got tired of turning on the television and seeing people who weren't infectious disease people talking about COVID. And since COVID was hitting people that look like you and me, nobody was coming on CNN or NBC or any of these shows that look like me or you. And the reason was, well, we can't find anybody. Well, that's not true now, because once we formed, everybody knew that you can go here and you can find somebody, person of color, to talk about whatever you want to talk about with this COVID pandemic. That was a good thing that came out of this. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I, I do want to give you a couple of seconds to brag on your children. <laughs> so I have four children. My oldest one is Matthew Philip George Banks. And Matthew, I guess you're once a Marine, always a Marine, but he was a JAG, is a JAG, was a JAG. He's now a military lawyer working down in Dayton, Ohio for Wright Pat. He just got married this summer uh, to a young, beautiful young woman, Jessica. And my my daughter, Mary, my oldest son, Todd, is a stay-at-home dad. He has a wonderful little grandson, Graydon, with his partner, Stevie. My daughter, Mary Banks, Mary Branch, is a cardiologist with her husband, Jonathan, who's a cardiologist, and she's a card last year cardiology fellowship at Wake Forest in uh, Winston-Salem, and she has a little daughter, Olivia. And Mark, my baby son, is finished college Worcester, and he is finished in theater and dance, and he's living in Los Angeles. He's doing insurance by day, but by evening, he still has that passion of producing and direct, which is what he trained to do at College of Worcester. Everybody's doing well, out of my pocket. So <laughs> out of my pocket, that's important. Yeah, and all the rooms, as soon as they left, every room was filled with my clothes so that everybody would know, you can't come back here. <laughs> no, you can't come back here. You can't come back here. No, I don't know where you're going, but you got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations and kudos to you on your um, podcast. And I'm just honored to be on here. I'm honored to have you here. <laughs> Again, I want to say thank you so much for being part of it. This was a wonderful conversation. That's the show about stuff, the Stephen Davis Show. Join us next week for another wonderful topic with another wonderful guest. Thank you for tuning in this week. Hope you enjoyed this show about stuff. See you next time.